Hello, and thank you for joining us. I'm Argo Wade, Chief of Staff for the Vice Chancellor for Student Affairs, and I'm happy to facilitate today's discussion, which is intended for all faculty, academic staff, university staff, graduate and professional students. Please note that our McBurney Disability Resource Center is providing captioning and interpretation services via the links listed below the video. A recording will also be available on YouTube for further viewing. Before we get started, on behalf of Chancellor Blank and the campus leadership team, I wanna say how much we appreciate the resilience and determination demonstrated by all of our employees. Thank you so much. We've implemented a new testing and tracking system for the spring semester that will allow the university to fulfill its essential mission while protecting students and employees alike. This is a bold solution to a big problem shaped by advice from scientific experts, public health agencies, and many of you. The new Safer Badgers program will dramatically expand our testing capabilities with the goal of quickly identifying people who may be asymptomatic carriers before they unknowingly spread it to others. We'll try to keep our opening presentations brief to allow for the maximum time for questions and answers. If you have a question during today's event, please email them to chancellor at wisc.edu. We have people monitoring that inbox right now. Our five panelists represent a much larger team of people who've been helping develop the university's COVID response plan. First, I'd like to introduce Jake Baggett, Associate Vice Chancellor and Executive Director for University Health Services. Carol Griggs, Director of Operations with University Health Services. And Carol leads the daily operations and planning of testing, in addition to the work being done on our vaccine distribution program. Todd Schechter, Chief Technology Officer, who has been leading the creation of the application and Mark Walters, Chief Human Resources Officer, who's on hand to address employee-related questions. Let's get started with Jake. Jake, can you walk us through the context of the Safer Badges program and the broader policy framework, why we believe this is the best way for us to move forward at UW Madison? Thank you, Argyle, and uh, appreciate the introduction. Uh, we had we learned a lot from our fall experience. We, we, we had uh, a significant amount of success. We implemented health protocols that were very proven, very beneficial and effective. Um, and one of the things that we learned is that regular testing, uh, as, as much as we could provide to our campus community, was vital to identifying uh, positive cases early, including those where people don't realize that they may be a carrier. And as a result of that, we were looking at, okay, what are the what what way can we expand our testing access to that and and the models that we considered needed to be big and bold as 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 Argyle was mentioning earlier one model that we looked at that uh, we saw really positive results from that was looking at uh, the University of Illinois where they adapted a saliva based testing model that had a tremendous amount of capacity um, in a relatively short turnaround while we were doing large numbers of tests with our campus-based testing program, we simply have tapped out that capacity and we're greatly appreciative of that. So we're adding to that with this new, new testing technology. Um, and so that, that's, that's what drove the, the decision to get there. Um, we know that from Illinois that their positivity rates, even when, when surges were experiencing, remained relatively low and fell back quickly. And we think that that will help us continue to be even more successful throughout the spring. Um, so we wanted to create a situation where everybody was expected or required to be to be tested and uh, and and support an overall identify cases quickly and 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 support them appropriately, and then um, uh, 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 remove any any chance for spread. Um, again, want to thank you for those who um, who've already you know taken advantage of these testing opportunities realize it's a whole new experience and not something that's that's intuitive, if you will. But um, we are seeing an improving rate of, of, uh, of success at that. And we're also working through, you know, process changes to to further enhance uh, the, the effectiveness and efficiency of, of, of that strategy. So I hope that's helpful. Yeah, thanks, Jake. Um, if you don't mind, you mentioned that people who had uh, some testing samples rejected, you know, we're getting questions from people who've had one or more of their drill samples rejected, what are we doing to help address that issue? Sure, thank you. And, and uh, you know, a little over a week ago, um, because of our early experience learning, you know, what, what was causing individuals difficulty with that, we started 
e evaluating our workflow and our processes, working with our lab very closely, but m more importantly was helping people understand what they needed to do to be successful. So there was a message sent out to the campus, it's available on the website as well, to really talk about all the preparation that you need to do in order in order to be successful to provide a, a, an adequate sample um, that, uh, that that can be processed by the lab. Um, so, you know, including that is really adhering strictly to the no eating or drinking uh, for at least an hour prior to your, your scheduled test appointment. I know that's hard. It's hard for me in the morning because I'm used to drinking coffee, uh, but, you know, those things are, are, are vital. Um, and then again, to uh, and Carol will talk in, in more detail later about, about about some of that. But it's also important not to over provide a sample, but provide between one milliliter and one and a half milliliters uh, of, of saliva at the collection point. Um, uh, it's, it's also been a, a, a tripping point as well. Um, we So hopefully that's helpful. Yeah, thanks. One more question for you, Jake, before I let you off the hook. People mm -hmm. are concerned about the safety of our testing sites. You know, there's some concerns about being exposed to the virus just by going to get tested. What are some of the precautions you and your team are taking to make sure those testing sites are safe? Again, we, um, we've taken a lot of time and thought into arranging a, and organizing the, the testing sites themselves and then the workflow that goes on throughout there. So, uh, and, and, and we also took from our lessons that we learned through the fall, which were very effective. Uh, we actually had no evidence through, throughout the fall of any uh, spread of, of COVID through our testing protocols. Uh, we further reviewed that and also took lessons from what was very effective at, at Illinois. So all of our sites were, were evaluated, make sure they had appropriate spacing, minimum of six feet between spaces, and in most cases, much more than that. Uh, make sure that people are maintaining the appropriate physical distancing. You know, there's regular cleaning protocols are in place uh, uh, to, to make sure that we don't have any issues there. And we also uh, have trained the staff to help support you. Um, and so listen to them carefully as they, as they kind of give you instructions about how to navigate the space. And what's also important is you continue to follow the health protocols, including wearing your mask. So while you're preparing to, uh, to, to provide your saliva, you're pooling or collecting that, um, it's important to leave your mask in place and only remove that when you're ready to you know, actually give your, your your sample or deposit that into the collection tube. And then you know, put your mask back in place. Um, those things will will make it a, 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 a very safe place to uh, to go and uh, a very low risk. Uh, thanks, Jake, so much for that. Before we continue on, I want to bring in uh, Charlie Hassa, the vice chancellor for university relations. Charlie's leading an immense team of people who are helping communicate all this very important information to the entire campus. Charlie, thanks for joining. I'll turn over to you to lead us down the road. Thanks, Argyle. Um, technical difficulties pre prevented me from, from joining right away. I'm got, glad we got those fixed, and I'm happy to continue uh, moderating from here. We're going to turn next to um, Carol uh, and talk a little, bit about, a little bit more about testing. Carol, can you walk us through what employees can be expecting this semester? Yeah, sure. So thank you, Charlie. Um, so this semester, as you engage in the saliva-based strategy, um, there are a couple things that you need to note before we kind of walk through that process. Um, there are really four things that you need to always have in mind. First, you need to get the app. Um, if you haven't downloaded the app yet, definitely do that. After that, you need to go and actually get your test. Um, but once you get your test, you're going to get your results. And from there, then once your results come back negative, you will then be granted access to the buildings. And so keep those four things in mind, get the app, get tested, get results and get access. And that'll kind of just help you to remember everything you need to do to be prepared for uh, classes on Monday. And so this semester, the uh, university has rolled out a new um, requirement. That requirement um, is that all everyone that's on campus is required to test at least once. Undergraduate students are actually required to test twice a week. Um, and then those that uh, employees and staff um, and graduate students are required to test at least once a week, um, better understood as once every eight days. The goal of that testing strategy, as Jake mentioned earlier, is to reduce the prevalence and in incidence of COVID on campus. We wanna um, ensure that we can identify um, COVID positive individuals as soon as possible so that we can ensure that they are removed from the population in our isolation, thus helping us to reduce those that are in quarantine. That is always the goal. 
Um, as many of you know, just from the articles and things that you heard in the fall semester, most of COVID transmission uh, was by asymptomatic individuals. And so the, the strategy here will help us to identify those um, positive cases within the asymptomatic population as quickly as possible. Undergraduate students that are on campus and those that live off campus, um, but within the Madison community are also required to test. For the graduate students and the faculty and staff, only those that are coming to campus are gonna be required to test. Um, the, uh, when, you, when you schedule your appointment for your COVID test, it's really important to remember that one, you should not eat or drink anything for at least an hour prior to coming. It's a really good uh, strategy if you gargle your mouth with water, um, at least an hour before you come, it helps to reduce, remove and reduce any residual food or particles or anything that you might have in your mouth. Um, the other thing that's really important to remember is that you really need to, to um, pull your drool. Underneath your tongue is actually where um, saliva is developed. That's actually where your saliva can pull. So it's really a good practice to pull the saliva underneath your tongue and then deposit it directly into your vial once you have an adequate amount that you feel you can deposit. At the site, you're gonna be required to uh, provide at least a one milliliter um, sample, no more than 1.5, um, but it really needs to be about one milliliter. Um, and when you deposit your saliva, it's really important to remember too that most saliva is gonna have bubbles and that's okay. Um, it's actually expected that your saliva is gonna have bubbles. There's a funnel at the top of the vial. That funnel is specifically designed to catch those bubbles to allow you to provide pure saliva into the actual vial. You might also have some bubbles that get into the vial, that's okay. Um, again, the goal is for you to have at least one milliliter of pure liquid within the vial. Um, and you're gonna see bubbles in it. And again, that's fine, just, just as long as you have enough of the actual liquid. Jake spoke a little bit earlier to some of the rejections that we've seen. Um, a lot of that has related to one, too much saliva. Um, two, we have seen some discoloration. And then three, a lot of people are actually depositing food particles and mucus into their saliva samples. The best way to avoid that is again, to pull your saliva under your tongue and deposit from there. Be very careful not to pull saliva from the back of your mouth, which is actually spit. Um, and you're gonna, if you do that, you're gonna pull particles from your tonsils into your saliva. I mean, particles from your tonsils and food particles from your tongue into the saliva. And you're gonna deposit that into the sample. And at that point, the sample actually can't be processed. Um, and there's staff on site that are helping folks with that all the time. Um, and so if they tell you that they see particles in your sample, um, you know, they're gonna be overly apologetic. The best thing at that point though, is for you to start over and provide another pure sample. Um, and so those are my, some of my recommendations with uh, providing a good sample. Um, the staff there are gonna encourage you and they're really gonna try to talk you through it. Um, but just take your time, do your best to pull that drool before you get there and uh, don't remove your mask until you have enough saliva in your mouth to deposit. Thanks, Carol. Lots of good information there. And I, I know we've got uh, information out uh, on uh, the website and uh, uh, in, in other places about the best way, best practices for uh, getting a saliva sample. One question for you though, um, we've got uh, a number of people who candidly don't really want to do the saliva test when would mm -hmm. prefer to do the nasal swab uh, as many of us were doing last semester. Under what circumstances would we make a, uh, that alternative test available? Yeah, sure, Charlie. So the one of the, and Jake mentioned this a little bit earlier, but one of the primary reasons that we transitioned to this new model um, is because of volume, because of the sheer volume of tests that we wanted to make available. Um, in the spring semester, we are making um, close to 82,000 tests available per week. Um, we have about 70,000 tests of saliva-based testing. We only have about 12 to 14,000 of nasal swabs. Most of those are actually gonna be utilized by the students that live in uh, the um, residence halls. Um, for an employee, faculty, staff that uh, need a nasal swab because of a medical contraindication, we will make accommodation um, accommodations for that population. We just don't have the volume to make them available broadly, and so we have to limit um, the best way to utilize them. We just we, there, there aren't enough of them to ensure that we can test asymptomatic the asymptomatic population. Um, and so, if anyone needs a uh, nasal swab because of a medical contraindication, um, the inability to produce saliva um, or anything that would prevent their ability to um, engage in that type of testing. We are making accommodations for that, but um, those are really the only circumstances that we have right now. Very good, thanks for that. 
Argyle, I'm going to come back to you with a question. Uh, part of the uh, Safer Badgers initiative, of course, deals with uh, access to buildings. Um, can you talk a little bit about the building access part of the plan? What's that going to look like uh, day to day? How can employees plan for the changes? That sort of thing. Sure. As you've said, part of our new initiative includes monitoring access to high activity buildings. We want to make sure that only those who've kept up with their testing are allowed to enter. Everyone, and that includes faculty, staff, and students, will have to show their Badger badge to gain entry. You can get to your Badger badge within the Safer Badger app by scrolling down to the Your Health section. Todd will talk a little bit more about the app in just a second. Your building access is granted or denied based on your testing status. And we don't really want anyone who's COVID positive, who's been in close contact to be among others. But let me be clear, this requirement for building entry doesn't start until Monday, February 1st. No student or employee should be restricted from any campus space until then. While people don't have to show their Badger badge right now, we do encourage people to start getting the habit of doing it. So who's gonna be doing the monitoring, actual monitoring at the buildings? Well, the campus has hired Badger Wellness Ambassadors who are gonna be, be at the entrances of select facilities all around campus. You simply need to show your Badger badge screen to them to gain access. You can do that really easily as you're just kind of walking into the, into the area. Uh, that app has a color of the day, a moving circle, your picture, your status to enter the building, but it does not show any of your personal health information. The Badger Wellness Ambassadors are going to be moving around campus from different from building to building. You may see them in the building one day, but not the next. And if you can't get into a building, but you don't know why, then you can call the Campus COVID Helpline at 608-262-7777. They can help you figure out what needs to be done to get you back in status. And even though we won't start restricting the building access until Monday, February 1st, there's already Badger Wellness Ambassadors out on campus today helping folks get used to this new process. Um, a, a number of people are still in a, a work at home environment uh, as we continue to, to move through and, and deal with the, the coronavirus. Uh, some of those folks are, say, are asking what they need to do if they're only going to be on campus every once in a while, or perhaps they're not planning to, to come to campus at all this semester. Do they still need the badge? And then related to that, a second question, what if an emergency comes up and someone finds out they've got to come to campus quickly to, to pick something up or fill in for someone, but they don't have a green badge? How does that all work? Sure. If you're an employee who never comes to campus, then no, you really don't need to worry about the badge because you're also not testing on our university sites. But if you ever do plan to come to campus, you will need a negative test result in the past eight days prior to being on campus in one of our facilities. So that means you got to plan ahead with your scheduling and your testing. Um, and you should test at least one day in advance before coming to campus just to give yourself enough time to get a result. But, you know, you might want to consider even doing that a couple days ahead of time just to make sure there's plenty of time. Really, when it comes down to it, the only emergencies that would prevent someone from me to have their badge check coming into a facility relate to life and property safety. You know, this means our first responders won't be stopped when they have to come into a building for an emergency. Likewise, facility emergencies. You know, really all other cases though, don't rise to an emergency that would necessitate us letting someone in who hasn't tested because it puts risk uh, on place of other people. Of course, the Badger Wellness advise, uh, Ambassadors have supervisors who can help work through any access problems that kind of happen. Good, thanks Argyle. Todd Schechter, let's go to you next. Um, you've been involved in developing a whole new app to support the Safer Badgers initiative that was referred to before. I know it's been a challenging process. There's been hiccups along the way, and you and others have spent literally hundreds of hours um, getting this up and up and going. Can you give us an update on where things stand with all of that? Absolutely. Thanks, Charlie. And and yeah, as you mentioned, this has been a big effort, and um, I, I really give thanks and appreciation to everyone from across campus who's taken part and who has helped us uh, get the Safer Badgers app off the ground. Uh, the Safer Badgers app is available today for both iPhones as well as uh, Android Google devices. Uh, you can head to saferbadgers.wist.edu to find download, download links for both uh, versions of the app. I'll point out that if you are one of the early users of the Android version of Safer Badgers, there's, there are uh, special instructions for you to make sure that you properly make the transition to the app that is published uh, in the App Store. Uh, our vendor, the, the vendor that helped us write Safer Badgers, is making continual updates and performance improvements to the app. 
Uh, we expect updates to be coming out at a pretty regular cadence. There's another one that is uh, planned for hopefully this weekend, uh, but we're very excited to have the app available. Uh, the Safer Badgers app is where all of us will be able to go to schedule our COVID testing appointment, to receive the results of our COVID test, to submit symptoms to the app, to participate in the Bluetooth exposure notification, and then as others have mentioned, to show our, our, our Badger badge. Um, this app is, has been reviewed by both Apple and Google. Um, I'm thankful for the security reviews that both of them did, as well as our own Office of Cybersecurity. Uh, we feel very good and confident about the security of, of uh, the Safer Badgers app. And I should point out as well that um, the Safer Badgers app does have the, the, the function of proximity notification. This is an opt-in feature, and this is in addition to the proximity notification app that the state of Wisconsin uses. Uh, we certainly encourage folks to participate in both, and, and both can run at the same time. Um, and I'll close by saying, uh, Charlie, that uh, for those that don't have a smartphone or wish not to install the Safer Badgers app on your personal smartphone, we do have a free smartphone lending program available from the Do It Help Desk. These are locked down smartphones, so they only run the Safer Badgers app but they're available free of charge, same day pickup, um, and, and you can keep it for the balance of spring semester. So we're excited about the app. Again, it's available today. Folks can head to saferbadgers.wisp.edu to find both download links. Very good, thanks, Todd. Um, a question for you, I know we've received, um, is whether people can add their other test results to the app. Say they've gotten a, tested at the Alliant Energy Center uh, here in Madison, or perhaps another third party like their healthcare provider. How does that functionality work? Yeah, absolutely. Good question, Charlie. That's one that comes up often. So there is a function in the Safer Badgers app today that allows you to take a photo of a past positive test result and upload that to University Health Services. We're only able to accept positive test results, though, and then uh, that take that gets uh, counted into to our record and uh, reflected in the uh, in the Badger badge. Very good, thanks. Uh, finally, I wanna to go to Mark Walters. Uh, and before I do, just a quick reminder, if you've got a question, uh, feel free to uh, email it to us at chancellor at wisc.edu. Um, we will get to as many questions as we can. Mark, uh, we've got a lot of employees uh, on uh, watching the program today. What do they need to know about complying with the, all the new protocols here? Uh, thank you, Charlie. Uh, we, we, all, we all need to do our part to, to keep the campus safe, and, and the testing protocol is, is meant to do that. And you heard that to a number of the experts today, and that realizing that this is an extra responsibility for, for us as employees, and, uh, and it's going to take some time for us to get acclimated to the, 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 the testing protocol. I went in and uh, I was tested this morning. It was a very smooth process. Uh, I'm not saying that uh, that it, it happened very quickly to, for me to provide my sample, but uh, I know I know that after a period of time it'll become uh, easier each time, and, and I thought it, it was smooth. We've indicated to supervisors that that they they, they they need to be flexible. They need to be provide employees with the ability to get tested uh, and uh, also be patient uh, as we're trans transitioning through through the uh, uh, implementation of the, of the testing protocols. There's a wealth of information out there for people to learn about the protocol and uh, things that they need to do through the frequently asked questions and uh, also uh, the questions with the, the, the COVID uh, uh, helpline that was mentioned earlier where folks can uh, ask questions. And they also can ask questions of their HR representatives that are out there to, to be able to uh, um, um, you know, get, get things that they need. I will say that that frequently asked question area um, has grown substantially. Uh, pretty much every scenario is identified. So I'd strongly encourage uh, folks to, to go to those, to those frequently asked questions. And so the people ask all the time about compliance with this and, 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 and we, we really are providing as much support as we can so that everyone can, can, be, can be compliant. But if there's a, a circumstance where an employee decides that they, they, they don't want to be compliant and they, they, they don't, uh, they don't uh, follow the protocols, that, that uh, we, we really need to, to uh, put in place corrective action to make that happen, which would include the possibility of discipline. Obviously, that's the last thing that we want to do. Uh, 
provide flexibility, making sure employees can be compliant. Uh, but I wanted to make it clear that in order for us to be uh, safe and, and, and really uh, address these pandemic issues, we need for everyone uh, to be compliant. And so I want to thank everyone out there for all the things that they've done during this pandemic. I continue to be very proud of how our campus has responded to all of the, all of the trials and tribulations. Thanks, Mark. Quick question for you. I know we've gotten this from folks. Is there a process for employees to request a medical accommodation regarding these testing requirements? And what about non-medical accommodations or just exceptions? Yes, uh, good question, Charlie. That uh, if uh, if individuals uh, uh, believe that they they have it, that they need a medical accommodation with the testing protocol, they should be uh, working with their division disability representative. Each uh, each college school and division have a division disability representative that can help them with that uh, to figure out what kind of accommodation may be needed, uh, and so that would be the contact for the non medical requests, more flexibility type requests that they should be working with their human resource representative and their supervisor to figure out uh, you know, how can we provide them with the support so that they can be in compliance with uh, uh, the testing protocol. Let me, uh, let me throw one more at you while, you're, while, while we got you, Mark. Um, since we're expecting employees to follow the testing protocol as a condition of their employment, can they get tested during work hours? Uh, yes, they can. Uh, th this is uh, this is uh, uh, something that we've uh, uh, that we've identified is that employees can during their work hours go and get tested in paid status. Now, obviously, we have different types of uh, employees uh, across campus. Those employees that are in hourly positions that they they will be uh, able to go and get tested during their normal work hours, and then those individuals that are in uh, in salaried positions that uh, they have the flexibility to go when they need to, to get tested. But what was mentioned earlier is we all need to, uh, we all need to uh, make concessions for when we need to get tested and make sure that, uh, make sure that we're in compliance. Great, thank you. Um, thanks, thanks everyone for those initial comments. We're gonna go to questions now uh, that have been submitted. Um, let's start uh, with, uh, with Argyle maybe if we could. Um, question, how are we addressing students who might not be complying with the masking or the physical distancing requirements that we have? Sure, Charlie. Uh, we do have a student code of conduct and this uh, behavior would fall under it. We would prefer, obviously, for people just to be able to give general reminders to students uh, about following our health protocols on our campus. A lot of times that's all that's needed to get somebody to remember to do the right thing. Uh, the testing regimen is also covered in our code of conduct. Really, our process is going to be to give students uh, some warnings and to try to remind them to get on the right page so the campus will have a centralized process for that. Uh, and if they don't uh, choose to do that, they'll be able to have to move through our conduct system. Uh, again, our hope is to do that just with some general reminders. If you do encounter a situation, though, where you see something you're concerned about, the Office of Student Conduct and Community Standards has a COVID reporting uh, response form on their website. You can go there and put information down and then we'll follow up uh, and try to address something that maybe you weren't able to address yourself. Great, thanks. Carol, question for you. Um, we've talked about how uh, the uh, testing results um, should be made available within 24 hours, uh, oftentimes less. How do holidays impact that, uh, that 24 hour timeline? Yeah, sure. So we actually, um, the goal of testing this semester is actually not to close for holidays. Um, and so we're, we're very hopeful that uh, holidays do not impact the turnaround time of results. Um, we did see some uh, delayed resulting that occurred over the weekend. Um, that was more so related to the fact that we, it was the first week of testing, uh, the, the first week of the lab operating um, at the capacity they were operating. Um, but the goal is for us not to have uh, test results impacted by any holidays or um, downtime. Good, and let me stick with you for this next question that's come in. If there's a delay in getting a test result for some reason, is there an option where a student could uh, still attend class, doesn't have his or her green badge, but would wear you know, appropriate PPE? Sure. So if a, if a student is still in compliance, that means that um, they've, they've remained on the schedule that they're supposed to stay on, their badge will actually remain um, access granted. 
Um, it's only for those students that get to the very end of the timeline. If they wait until the last day at the last moment to get their test, um, the result can come the next day, which means their badge will, badge will flip to no access granted the, the next day. Um, and so for those students, unfortunately, there really isn't a way around it because, again, the goal of this is to protect the campus. And so we need that negative test result. What we don't want to happen is for someone to actually go into a class, um, they're non-compliant, um, and then later, you know, their, their result comes back positive. Um, again, they're following the health protocols, and so either way we look at it, they should be safe. Um, but we just want to prevent that if we possibly can. Got it. Um, Jake Baggett, let me turn to you for this next one. Um, some folks, as, as we begin the second semester here and, and people are coming back uh, to campus from around the state, around the country, around the world. Uh, some concern about um, all those folks coming back to campus and um, being at the testing sites uh, and potentially having, uh, you know, the coronavirus uh, or being positive. Uh, I know we touched on this a little bit earlier, but talk just a little bit more about the safety protocols that we're putting in place so people don't have to be concerned when they're going to the testing sites. Sure, and thank you. And and actually, that's one of the reasons that we also, because there is movement, uh, uh, you know, back to the Madison area. Um, it's one of the reasons we put these testing requirements in place uh, prior to the start of the semester, so that we could help folks identify those cases that uh, they might not realize uh, are present. Um, but the protocols, you know, the the physical distancing, the you know, the scheduling process, the um, uh, the, the layout and, and the process throughout the testing sites is specifically designed to, to minimize that risk, to prevent, uh, you know, uh, the, the spread within that. And, and those protocols have worked. They've worked well um, uh, at, at, at Illinois. Uh, they're very similar protocols for the spring, which also were very effective. It's important that people continue to wear their mask uh, throughout that process. So, and, and only lower that mask briefly long enough to deposit the saliva that you need to in, in the in the test uh, collection tube um, and then and then put it back in place. Those things will really minimize the risk. That's actually probably one of the safer places um, uh, uh, on, on campus in terms of, of, of expression. And I just would remind folks that the testing site staff are there to help you navigate that and support you so that so that you can feel safe and supported through that process. Good. Um, let me stick with you for this next question, Jake. Um, are there different types of, of tests that will be acceptable as a negative result? You know, there's there's rapid tests, there's PCR, there's antigen tests. Um, what, what are we accepting? So what, uh, and we've, we've carefully considered this, um, really the gold standard, the most reliable and accurate test is the PCR test, which is which is the one that we ran in the fall and, and, and are expanding uh, with here in the spring. Antigen tests or other rapid testing uh, uh, options um, are, are, are helpful, but there is a, a, a chance of a false negative or a false positive, depending on where you're at in, in the, in the incubation period during an infection. So the PCR test is really the most reliable so that we can appropriately manage those. So we, we won't be able to accept anything uh, other than the PCR test run here all through the campus operations. If you were a past positive um, or have a past positive PCR test, um, you can upload that as Todd referred to earlier through, through the app. And, and that can be helpful information and, and also will be incorporated in the information, but it has to be a PCR test and those actually will be evaluated by medical personnel uh, for appropriateness as well. Thank you. Um, I'm gonna go to uh, Argyle, I think, with this next question. Um, yeah, uh, we've got uh, obviously a, a large campus, um, there's the main campus, but there's also a, a number of, of people who work in off-campus sites. Maybe it's an agricultural research station uh, up at Arlington or elsewhere around the state. Do the folks that are working uh, for the university but not on the main campus, do they need to be tested? How does this all uh, relate to them? Sure. I can give an initial response and love to hear Mark's uh, comments on this as well. Uh, my understanding is that this really testing program is really focused on our campus, uh, the Madison campus proper. Uh, that said, there may be uh, additional 
uh, expectations that a unit or area have uh, for their employees. And so my suggestion is uh, if you are in a situation where you're working in a site that's not on the Madison campus, that you consult with your department unit, a division school college to make sure you understand kind of what their expectations are in regards to testing. Mark, how does that uh, sync with what you're telling employees? Yeah, so I, I would agree with that, that uh, consulting with your, your unit to figure out the exact protocol that you'll need to follow based on based on your responsibilities. So a somewhat related question to that, this will be for uh, Jake, I think. Um, we do have employees who live you know, a fair distance away from the university, uh, maybe an hour or more. Um, is, there, is there a way that they can get tested off campus and, and have that accepted uh, uh, for on-campus purposes, or do they need to be tested here? They, they, they need to be tested here through the campus process for, for a couple of really important reasons. One is the availability of PCR testing in other parts of the country um, are vary considerably, as well as the timeliness of the testing results, depending on, on what's going on there. So, uh, so that those are those are issues as well. And by the time somebody then uh, took their test, got their results submitted it to the institution, they were reviewed uh, as, as necessary. Um, they, we may be actually past the useful period of, of, of that test in terms of being in compliance. So we really need to use the campus test. I would add um, folks who have been previously tested positive off campus within the past 90 days can submit uh, evidence of that to be reviewed through the app and they can be exempted for that 90 day period from the date of that of that test from that requirements but that's the only circumstances right now that that that, that would apply thank you um and i know we touched on this before but it's come up in the in the questions so i want to hit it again uh what happens if a test result is delayed and the employee needs facility access um and i don't uh, carol i think you touched on that and argyle as well I think, again, we want to emphasize that um, there's very few times we want to have people entering a facility um, without a test on file that's negative um, because of the chance of transmission to other people. Yes, there's going to be some emergencies, but those are really life safety and property safety issues that our first responders will be coming in for. If a person finds himself in a situation where their test result just uh, didn't come out uh, in the way that they needed at the time they needed. I think the best course of action is to talk to their supervisor, to talk to their faculty member, uh, to work that out and try to figure out what flexibility is there. I, again, refer to my colleagues to see if there's other uh, ideas you would share with uh, with the people who are watching. Yeah, no, I would definitely agree with Argyle on that. Um, I think that, I mean, that's, the, that's definitely the best public health approach. Um, we want folks to have that negative test on file. Um, I would strongly encourage people just plan ahead, um, you know, get your test a day early so that you can give yourself that wiggle room if you need to respond in a, in a different way. Um, but yeah, in agreement with Argyle, the public health protocol is there to protect campus. And so we really need everyone to, um, to have that negative result. Great, Carol, let me um, come back to you with this question. I know uh, you've gotten it, I've gotten it. Uh, last semester, we had, you know, uh, drive-through and, and, and rapid testing options. We're not doing that this semester. Can you talk about why? Sure, yeah. The, um, so drive-up testing, um, the way that drive-up testing works is it's very much so an outdoor event. Um, you know, you pull up, you park, you uh, leave your sample. Um, there's typically someone from the testing staff that's there to assist you. We did do that in the fall semester with the nasal swabs. Um, and once we got to the spring, and I, I mean, once we got to the, to the winter, um, it actually became very difficult for the staff to manage. Um, they were in the elements more frequently. Um, in addition to that, one of the key pivots for this semester uh, was to a program where we could expand the amount of testing we had. Um, and we also, with that, we also have limited staff. And so we were expanding how many tests we had um, within the staffing model that we had. And we did expand the staffing model some, but um, the goal was to expand testing. So the difference in a drive-up site and the difference in a saliva-based site um, that's indoors is a drive-up site, we really can only make about 80 appointments available in a day. Um, and so we're pulling staff to staff that for a day. Um, at a saliva site, we can make anywhere from 384 to 1,000 appointments available in a day. And that, that difference is, is really significant when you're 
we're going to offer 84,000 tests on campus. Um, and so uh, that's that's one of the reasons that we don't have drive up testing available. It is something that we are considering for the spring once we get to that point. Um, hopefully at that point we'll have more experience with saliva base so people will feel really comfortable. Um, we've worked really hard to ensure that we have convenient testing locations um, sporadically sp spread across campus so that folks can uh, you know, pop in for their test, if you will. Um, in the spring, we will reconsider it, but right now there's not a, an easy way or a good way to really incorporate that into our strategy. So we should all be hoping for a uh, for an early and warm spring then. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and uh, my understanding is, um, you know, there's, there's questions about um, people having to, to, you know, go to the testing site uh, and, uh, and go inside. Uh, We've, we've made arrangements so that people can park free, is, uh, is that right? We have, yes. So each testing location has a designated parking lot. Um, I do believe that information is available on our, on our COVID response website. Um, if you pull into that lot, once you go to uh, complete your COVID test, you should get a uh, validation sticker or ticket, um, and that will allow you to get out of that um, particular garage for free. And so we do have uh, free parking available. Again, the goal and the way that we designed this was to really try to ensure that we had test sites close to people so that you know they could just kind of pop into the test site um, in a convenient location. And so if you you know want to get out and stretch your legs in the midst of this pandemic when we're all sitting down all the time in front of computers i would strongly encourage it i also know that we're in wisconsin and it's freezing outside so if you need to drive over to a site you definitely can do that and have free parking great thanks um and i'm going to come back to you with one more question carol uh keep you on the hot seat here um you know happily we're we're at a point where we're starting to see uh the vaccines roll out. Uh, I know University Health Services has started uh, uh, vaccinating the phase 1A group and will soon be starting the phase 1B group. If a person gets vaccinated, can they just show that proof of, of vaccination instead of having to show their green badge to, to get into a building? Yeah, that's a great question, Charlie. So um, the, vac the efficacy of the vaccine ranges between 95 and 90 percent, 97 percent. Um, and so what that means is that we have a very good vaccine on our hands. Um, however, we are still dealing with a small percentage of the population that can still contract and transmit COVID-19. Um, because of that, the uh, CDC as well as DHS has recommended that folks continue to follow the public health protocols, which includes testing, um, even once they have been vaccinated. Um, that's definitely going to continue to be the case as long as the CDC and DHS recommend it. Um, and until we can see more vaccines available, that I don't really anticipate they're going to reassess that. And so right now, um, e even if you fall within the tier 1A or tier 1B population, you're still going to be required to get that COVID test. Um, and I will also say, too, since we're kind of talking about who should test and who shouldn't, if you are a past positive within the last 90 days, and you become symptomatic of anything that remotely resembles COVID, you still need to talk to a public health, a healthcare provider. There's been uh, a lot of research out there kind of assessing uh, symptomatic status once a person uh, recovers from COVID um, and the research is actually divided. And so it's really, really important that you uh, consult with your whoever your primary care provider is. Good deal. Um, Mark Walters, let me come back to you for this question. Uh, that come in. What if my test is rejected and I can't get into the building that I work in? How will that absence be reflected on my on my timesheet? Well, what, what employees should do if that happens is they should be talking to their supervisor to see whether they can uh, reschedule their shift, uh, get the flexibility so that they can work their hours, so that they there isn't a, a need to take any uh, uh, any leave time uh, on their on their uh, um, put leave time on their timesheet, uh, but. Uh, if that is not a possibility, that employees will need to take uh, some kind of leave for, for that circumstance. Great. Um, and let me stick with you, Mark. Uh, in addition to Badger ambassadors, can supervisors check the, the testing status on the Safer Badger app of their staff and, and enforce the testing policy? Yeah, they are, supervisors are able to ask employees to, to see their badge to make sure that it's, uh, that it's, that it's green, it's valid, and... Uh, um, that that is uh, that is a requirement. Uh, uh, we're, it certainly it's up to the units uh, how they want to do that. Uh, some areas will uh, be uh, some units may be more vigilant in that area with, uh, compared to others, but supervisors do have that ability. 
Thanks. Um, a question for uh, Argyle, if I can. Um, we've talked about uh, students and employees coming in and, and out of buildings and what's required there. What about the other folks, the, the vendors, the contractors? How is all, the, all that going to work? Sure. We know there's a lot of people that keep this campus moving, uh, people that come to our campus that do deliveries, contractors, vendors that are doing work in our buildings. Uh, anybody who's in a, a situation where they're wearing a uniform uh, and are here on our campus for a business purpose, uh, they do not need to be uh, uh, show the badge. They do not need to be escorted into the building uh, because they're here for a designated work purpose. If there's a person coming in on an appointment um, that's not in uniform, uh, they would need to be met at that facility and escorted into the building by someone who's from that building uh, that they're meeting with or doing work for. Uh, so we know that they're legitimate. Otherwise, we would have no way to differentiate them from somebody else uh, who's coming in the building. So uh, we do want to make sure that things can keep moving. Uh, the loading docks in the buildings, uh, we've worked with building managers to make those sure those are still open and functional, although we just really want those for those business purposes, not for people to use them as a way to get around the Badger Wellness Ambassadors. Very good. Um, let me go back to uh, our, our Chief Technology Officer, Todd, here. Um, I'm sure this doesn't happen often, but it, in the few instances that it does, what happens if I open the Safer Badgers app and it's not working? Yeah, absolutely, Charlie. Uh, so, you know, uh, if you do need technical assistance at all with the Safer Badgers app, we do have a call center that is, is up and ready to take calls. Um, our COVID assistance, our COVID-19 assistance line is open Monday through Friday, 7 a.m. to 8 p.m., Saturday, 7 a.m. to 5 p.m., and Sunday, 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. The phone number here is shown on the screen, 608-262-7777, or you can email the assistance line at covidresponse at vc.wisp.edu. Um, much like other apps on our smartphones, though, uh, at least for me, if an app doesn't work, my first thing to do is to quit the app and restart it. That often will fix folks' problems. Hit restart, the, the great answer from all of our IT friends. Did you did you try restarting it? Uh, let me go back to Carol. Um, we talked a, a moment ago about vaccination. Will vaccination status be included in the Safer Badger app in the future? And and uh, again, how does that how does that affect testing requirements? Sure. Um, and so right now, again, since um, the CDC and DHS still recommend that you continue the public health protocols to include testing, um, we don't have plans at present to include vaccination status in the badge because it doesn't necessarily change the outcome of the badge in any way. Um, now that said, you know, things in this pandemic are changing quickly. And so I'm sure if, if uh, the CDC and DHS reach a different decision on that, um, that will be something that we will consider. At present, it's not something that we're planning to incorporate. Great. Um, uh, Jake or, or Carol, whichever uh, question coming in, uh, how do I know how much a drool is one milliliter? And can on-site staff help me figure that out? Sure, yeah, I can pick that one, Jake, unless you, unless you want to. Go ahead. All right. So when you get to the testing site, you'll actually pick up a vial. On the vial, it, it will actually have a marker that shows you one ml. Um, there's a, there are two other markers. There's one that's 1.5 ml and another that's 2 ml. Um, if you get to 2 ml, you've gone too far. Um, we really need you to rest between 1 and 1 1.5. Staff will also assess your sample when you finish. Um, now, this is really important. They're going to look at your sample, one, for volume to ensure that you have enough or that you don't have too much, but also, two, for clarity. Um, when you're at the site and you deposit your sample, if your sample is too cloudy, discolored, has visible chunks, or has strings, which is typically signs of mucus, they will tell you that your sample will likely be rejected by the lab. If they tell you that, the best thing to do is to re-lubricate uh, your saliva glands and try to produce another sample. The reason we want you to do that is to avoid you having to come back to a test site um, at a different time to provide another sample. We prefer to handle that on the front end if we can. Um, and so if staff encourage you to do that, it's really important that you that you do that if you can. Um, and Jake, let me go to this one, uh, go to you with this one. Um, we've talked about uh, employees and um, graduate professional school students. Uh, have to basically be tested once every eight days. Um, how did we come come up with eight days? Well, the, the eight days, really what we're trying to get at is people be have the opportunity to get 
tested once a week is, is really what the goal was. Uh, but we wanted to build in some flexibility so that if, uh, so somebody didn't have to come on the same day or if they needed to come a day earlier, they, they, had, they had a little bit of, 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 of leeway in order to, to, to still be compliant. So th that's, that was the, the, the objective behind that. So really the goal is, is, is get tested and get a positive or a negative result um, uh, once a week, um, but allows you a little bit of leeway to accomplish that in case you're not on campus the same day every day, every week. Very good. Um, and I, we, we touched on this a bit before, but we've got another question or two about it. So I'm going to hit it again, Carol. Um, if I'm, if a person is unable to produce the proper amount of saliva when they go to test, what then, you know, can they, can they switch and just do a nasal swab? Do we tell them to come back later. Do we tell them to, to go smell some, some chocolate chip cookies? Yeah, you know, it's funny you say that, Charlie. We actually have had recommendations this week to have um, diffusers with warm cookies or jalapenos. I'm not sure which one will work best for you. I think uh, for me, jalapenos will probably be good. Um, for uh, folks that can't produce enough saliva, um, on site, the staff is going to encourage you to try a different, uh, a couple of different techniques. Um, if that doesn't work, they will encourage you to contact your DDR. Uh, the DDR can help you with the accommodation process, and that is the process that you have to utilize for nasal swabs. Um, I would encourage you before you do that, unless you are already on a medication or you have a medical contraindication that um, actually prevents the production of saliva, I would encourage you to give it a couple tries. I know that we're getting uh, close to that window of time where it's going to be required to have that negative test, um, but we do have we still have some flexibility, and so I would encourage you to really work on it and try. I say that again because we have limited nasal swabs. Um, and also this is a new strategy that, you know, we all have to get used to. Um, depositing saliva into a vial is not a very intuitive process. It's something that we do have to work at. Um, and so give it a couple of tries, um, you know, give yourself an opportunity to uh, produce the saliva to leave that sample. Um, and again, if, if you just, you know, after two, three times, you, you just can't do it and you can't figure out why, reach out to your DDR for assistance. Um, Todd, let me come to you with this one. Uh, question is, how do I know whether the test uh, testing is still ongoing or if my uh, sample has been rejected? Um, you know, the, the, the updates don't, don't, don't come uh, automatically. How does that all work? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Charlie. So um, our goal is that all test results should be delivered back to end users uh, to our smartphones, the Safer Badgers app, within 24 hours. We know right now that sometimes that's taking longer, up to 48 hours. Um, what, our, what we would encourage you to do is if you're not seeing the result in your app, then to head to the MyUHS website and look to see if your result is in the MyUH website, MyUHS website. Um, if it still is not there after a couple of days, the recommendation simply is to get another test. We're working carefully with the vendors that are doing all of the technology for us behind the, the labs that are managing the technology for us to, um, to tighten up these processes, to get results delivered faster. Uh, but we know that we're, we're coming into some brand new technology here. So again, um, best thing to do is to look in your app. If you're not finding it in your app, head to the MyUHS website. And if you're not finding it in the MyUHS, MyUHS website after 48 hours, then to simply get another test. Thanks, Todd. Um, Mark, let me uh, throw a couple of questions at you that have come in here. One is, uh, how does the eight-day requirement uh, relates to issues like leave or furlough. Uh, and the second is um, if I'm out of town for a week, I'm, I'm on vacation uh, and um, uh, I've, got to, I've got to start working the next Monday uh, and I've got to come in on the Sunday to get tested. Um, is that considered work, re re work related? Do I somehow put that onto my timesheet or, or is that basically on my own time? Well, the, the, I talked about the difference between hourly employees and salary employees for, um, earlier. For hourly employees, when you have that circumstance where someone takes a week vacation and they have to come to campus to get tested before they can report to their, to their, to their next shift, that uh, uh, we should, uh, employees should be working with their supervisor and HR representative to address those things. And there will be the possibility of providing uh, some, paid, some paid time for that to occur. And we'll be providing more guidance on that in the real near future. Um, so that, that, that could be realized that, that that is a real inconvenience. Uh, I mentioned earlier that uh, 
that uh, this is an extra responsibility and we need to plan ahead. Uh, but we realize that that eight day window uh, creates a problem if someone takes a, a, a week or longer vacation and having to come to campus to get tested. And so so having some uh, uh, ability to be in pay status during those situations. For those employees that are in salaried positions, um, they would not be getting extra compensation uh, for that, but um, they would still be required to come and, and get tested and, and uh, um, get a negative test before they're able to come back to the campus, uh, um, become, come back on campus. Very good. Um, a question uh, for Carol here. Um, if I have been recently vaccinated and then go for a test, um, is there a chance that I might still test positive? Yeah, sure, Charlie. So um, no, the answer is no. Uh, the COVID vaccine itself does not include any live virus. And so what that means is that if you go for a standard PCR test or even an antigen test, um, it should not come back positive because of that. The only thing that would be impacted from a COVID vaccine is a serology uh, result. Um, and again, we're, we're utilizing PCR testing, and so um, that should not be the case. Great. And uh, a question for uh, Argyle. You talked before about um, uh, visitors uh, and um, uh, contractors and so forth not having to take a test. Questions come in, um, you know, isn't there the same level of risk uh, for those folks coming in and not, not being tested uh, as, you know, an employee or a student? And how are we, sure. how are, how are we mitigating that? Yeah, you know, this has a little bit to do with technology, a little bit of health protocols. So I also love my colleagues to chime in on this. But, uh, you know, we our hope is that vendors, contractors and other people who are coming to our campus uh, that are part of our employer student basis. Obviously, we're expecting them to still do all health protocols, facial masks, you know, physical distancing, doing the right things when they're in our facilities. You know, we don't have the ability to incorporate them into our testing regimen or to bring their testing results from other areas outside of our, our lab and our testing structure into our Badger Wellness Ambassador badge uh, so that we'd be able to verify them at the door. Our hope is that their interactions are brief, they're in, they're out, they do what they need to do, uh, and the chances of exposure and transmission are low. If there are concerns like you know about a specific situation, again, I think those are ones you'd wanna to elevate to your building manager, to your supervisor, your unit director, uh, because there may be situations we need to take a look at. Great. Um, question uh, for Jake as we get ready to, to wrap up here. Um, how long do you have to be off campus if you test positive? So the, the current guidance is is 10 days and actually all that information is incorporated into your um, uh, into your app. So really following the app will, will help you as well as you'll be contacted by a contact tracing staff to, to help answer any questions that you might have as well. So it really should be pretty straightforward in, in, in that regard. Great. And uh, maybe we'll give the last question here to, uh, to Carol. Uh, do we still need to fill out the symptom tracker if we're coming to campus and the tests are being done right there? Yeah, so the symptom tracker itself has actually been embedded into the Safer Badger application. I think it's really important to consider what the symptom tracker is there for. Um, it's there so that we can help you navigate what your next step needs to be if you do develop symptoms. Um, and so once you identify that you have symptoms, the badge will actually tell you what the appropriate next step is. Again, that's just the best um, kind of public health approach. I'll also say, um, since we're kind of talking about the, the public health approach, uh, one of the things that we've heard recently, um, specifically over the last week, is that folks are feeling um, somewhat crowded uh, when they enter the testing space. Um, and I want us to kind of start uh, rethinking the way that we are experiencing that. Um, and the reason I say that is because we have been uh, conditioned in this pandemic um, to, to not enter spaces with other people. We've been conditioned um, to social distance, to keep our mask on, and, and we've been uh, somewhat re, um, re uh, wired, if you will, to not do that. And so we don't feel comfortable with that in the same way that we did prior to the pandemic. Transitioning from the model that we use in the fall to this model, you are gonna be in spaces with other people. We've done all of the work that we needed to do to ensure that your social distance, um, the spaces are safe. We have staff there to monitor everything, um, but, but people are gonna feel, um, or the perception of the space might be a little different. And so I would encourage folks to just give it a little bit more time. 
Um, there are some things that we have noticed in this process, especially over the course of this week, that we're retooling and reworking um, to encourage a, you know, a safer environment for everyone. Um, but again, I mean, we've been conditioned that way uh, because of the, the pandemic in the fall. And I would just encourage people, give it a little bit more time, um, bear with us, and uh, we're going to do everything we can to protect the campus, to protect you, and to protect one another. Excellent. Thank you, Carol. That's a great place to, uh, to leave it. I'm afraid we're out of time. Uh, I want to thank my colleagues for sharing their time and their expertise. More importantly, I want to thank all of you who tuned in today uh, for watching, for your participation, and for your questions. Remember to keep checking the COVID-19 response website for the latest information and the FAQs, which are updated constantly, and keep a, keep a look out in your inbo inbox for weekly updates. That's all the time we have for today. Be well, stay safe, and on Wisconsin.